The Michael Hatfield Remax team presents Real Estate and More. Bay Area real estate is different than in all of America. And why? What's up with home buyers? What's on sellers' minds? How is the market? And much, much more. Now, here's your host, Michael Hatfield. Welcome to the Real Estate and More show, and thank you for listening. We have an incredibly interesting topic of discussion this morning with a very special guest, a man who has formerly assisted with lifeguard flight operations, helping to save lives in the organ donor transplant environment. Our show today is about the life-saving process of organ transplant, the critical infrastructure ensuring that organs get from location A to location B, the time-sensitive nature of it all, and some about the immense changes for a donor recipient's life. A new beginning, and when minutes matter. On the show this morning, I have Mr. Brad Davis, former transplant coordinator for a Midwestern Transplant Center. Welcome to the show. I call you Michael. Please do. All right. (laughs) Absolutely. First of all, we need a little bit of backstory. At a recent social event... Brad and I had an opportunity to compare past history interests and mutual occupations being involved with lifeguard transplant operations. Brad as a transplant coordinator in the 1990s and myself as a former pilot of lifeguard flights way back in the 1970s. Our mission in the lifeguard flight operation and transplant environment was to ensure human donor organs got from a donor to a recipient as expeditiously as possible. Firstly, for our listeners, can you explain exactly what is a lifeguard flight? Yeah, lifeguard flight um, is used when we need to transport a transplant team uh, to a donor hospital. Um, and then return the team with the organ uh, back to uh, the recipient hospital. Um, the, the flight may be out of an airport, and we use ground transportation then from the airport uh, to the hospitals. Um, in some situations, we'll use a um, helicopter to get us from the airport to, to the hospitals. But um, all of that transportation, transportation is, is considered lifeguard minutes matter and in the air traffic control environment the lifeguard flight is identified in the call sign of the actual flight and it's unique elevated priority in the air traffic control system and they're somewhat immune to ATC delays uh, that most flights endure during normal operations of, of airline flights. However, without holding patterns for weather, as an example, a lifeguard pilot may have to use his experience to decide whether weather conditions are safe enough in order to proceed. So, Brad, lifeguard flights are only for heart organs or are they for other organs as well? Uh, they're <clears throat> for any organ that needs to be transported um, quickly to to the recipient facility or, or even you know getting the um, transplant team to the donor hospital quickly um, the uh, donors hearts only beat for a certain amount of time and so often we can be rushed to get to the donor hospital as well as once we get the organ out getting back to the recipient hospital as quickly as possible and I was going to add you know, you were mentioning um, the lifeguard status. I remember, you know, a number of times when we would, uh, we, we flew out of JFK, for example, and uh, here we are in this little Lear jet passing all these huge, seven, back then it was 747s, waiting to, to take off, and we were, didn't go under their wheels or under under the planes, but felt like it. We were just right up against them and traveling down the uh, uh, tarmac to get to the runway. Huge priority with the yeah. lifeguard flight, just yep. huge. I, I can't say enough about how your heart swells to be involved in a life-saving operation like a lifeguard flight, and that mm-hmm. certainly is is uh, integral when minutes matter right. as part of the transplant operation. Do you know what nation's transplant system saves more lives than any other country in the world in, like, say, 2021? Mm. Yeah, I haven't been keep, keeping up with the statistics, but I know the United States has led the world in, in uh, organ, organ transplant. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, in the 90s, we had uh, surgeons come from all over the world to train 
uh, at the few transplant centers then, uh, and then go back to their countries and start transplant programs. Wow, very, very interesting. I hear a lot of people uh, ask, they say, what is the difference between a lifeguard flight and an angel flight? Uh, do you know that one? Or Yeah, I, well, I think, um, you know, uh, lifeguard flights are not in any, in, you know, air transportation is not only used for organs, but it's also used for patients, as, you know, people, people know if there's a trauma, you know, that patients are transported as well. So I think those may be um, angel flights. Um, the... Uh, you know, so anytime air, air transportation is used, um, you know, those are either angel or lifeguard flights. Mm -hmm. And yeah. angel, angel flight has requirements that the patient actually is ambulatory and able to travel in a small, unpressurized aircraft. Oh, uh, okay. With, yeah. Yeah. And these are airplanes that may not have access to lavatory facilities and for the, for the duration of the flight. And mm -hmm. they must have a, a personally signed letter from the physician in order to uh, travel on an angel flight and it's a humanitarian organization that usually operates the angel flight so to speak mm -hmm. and they're usually volunteer pilots there whereas in the operation you and I were involved mm -hmm. with it was lifeguard that was a, a different thing altogether yeah and I was gonna say that um, you know oftentimes we had to call our recipients in organ transplant recipients in from uh, you know some of them were uh, stable enough to be at home and so in in some cases may have needed to have relied on those angel flights to get to the hospital so they could get their transplant while the lifeguard flight goes off and takes the transplant team to and from the uh, donor hospital so i can see how those two would work together mm -hmm. so there is a definite life to the organ um, mm -hmm. once it has is ready uh, to be um, exchanged into the um, to the recipient there's mm -hmm. definitely usually on a heart it's what Nowadays, uh, four, well, I think it's always been about four to five hours. So hearts are hearts and lungs um, are more sensitive to the cold ischemic time than than the other organs. Uh, liver, pancreas, uh, even small intestine; those are probably still being done. Um, you know, require uh, be in, to be implanted within eight to twelve hours. So, you, we always hear you know the the heart teams would always have more, much more dramatic transportation. They would have the helicopters to and from the airport. They would have the you know the the faster jets you know to get to and from the airports. Uh, the the liver team I used you know, I would mainly focus on the abdominal organ uh, transportation. Um, we had a little bit more time, so we you could we could actually get away with taking an ambulance to and from the hospital, to the to the airport, uh, or uh, yeah, to and from the airport, and then taking air transportation from there. Yeah, the, the, yeah. isn't there requirements also for that flight to be available? Um, the pager and all that. I remember this. Maybe you would yeah. like to expand on yeah. that. Yeah. So so the way. The way the process works is, you know, as a transplant coordinator, I would get a call in the middle of the night from our, our answering service. They would say, Brad, we've got a, uh, uh organ donor uh, offer that you need to call the hospital and, you know, wherever it was. So I would call them, get the information on the donor, call the surgeon, explain, you know, what we had. And this is, uh, this is often in the middle of the night because that's when just the timing of the whole process, donor process uh, ends up being in, you know, things start happening in the middle of the night. And the surgeon would then, you know, say, you know, make a determination of whether we, we should go, uh, go get it. And at, it was at that point, I'd call someone like you to say, listen, we need to go down to, uh, Mississippi. And, uh, can you, you know, how quickly can you get a, a plane on the tarmac, uh, for us at the airport? And you may not have your plane, uh, at the airport that's closest to our hospital or where from where we're we're leaving um, so you'd have to relocate the plane you know to that uh, FBO and meet us there and then we would fly from that but the timing of the um, you know calling the rest of the team get everyone else together um, it took uh, it was based on how quickly the, the pilots could get the uh, plane ready because, you know, if we don't have a plane, we're not going anywhere. So Absolutely. you guys had to be on call and, you know, I'd like to hear your end of the, <laughs> how it felt to be called in the middle of the night and what you had to do to yeah. get the plane ready and get us, get, get it, meet us at the uh, um, specific time. How much time did you have? For Actually, example? the uh, 
the dedicated aircraft was at the airplane at the airport it was san jose at the time yeah this was back in the 70s and yeah. this was when some of the first even before homes, my time before your time <laughs> and the, this was the airplane was ready and we had to be able to respond within 20 minutes wow and so the call would come in from eu the yeah. transport coordinator mm -hmm. we would actually have someone filing the flight plan to go wherever it was going to go while the pilot was launched mm -hmm. to the airport and the airport was dedicated or the airplane was actually dedicated mm -hmm. to to be available uh, for those those circumstances yeah but it was uh, it was an amazing amazing time amazing yeah the, time. the the choreography you know of getting everything you know, time. You talk about timing things. Um, that was, I mean, and you know, my title was a transplant coordinator. Um, timing was everything. We had to predict, you know, when we were going to be, you know, when we could get the team to the airport, when we would be into the donor hospital and into the operating room. There, they had to have the patient in the operating room ready to go. So we had to, and then that's on the donor side. And then once um, you know the organs recovered, you know, the t the clock is ticking on the organ we had to predict the time coming back and when the the surgeons at the recipient site uh or the recipient or need to get started so that there's as little time wasted between the time the organ is taken out and the time the the organ is sewn in um and so it all comes down to timing and a um yeah i would say a choreography of of things that had to you know move at a particular uh, pace and uh, predictable uh, time frame. There's a there's a only a certain set of ser of parameters where a heart, for example, can be used, and mm -hmm. it cannot. You, you we were talking off the air. When yeah. can um, a don a donor heart be become available, and what is the difference between one that cannot be a donor heart? Right, please. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, a lot of people are asked, um, you know, to sign your driver's license to indicate whether you want to be an organ donor or not. And what a lot of people don't understand or, or realize is that only um, a few people or, you know, only a certain percentage of all deaths can uh, uh, be used as organ for, for organ donation. You know, looking at 20 to 30 years ago, but... Uh, it's only those patients who have been diagnosed with, with irreversible brain death. So this is head trauma, uh, gunshot wounds, you know, it, you know, unimaginable in some cases, you know, circumstances where the head is traumatized um, enough to stop brain activity irreversibly, um, but the heart continues to beat. And it's in those rare cases, and I think, you know, the percentages back in the 90s probably still the same, was only about 4% of all deaths could result in organ donation. Um, so you, it, it, it does a couple of things. I mean, it means something to me to say that, um, you know, it's a low likelihood that anyone who dies will become an organ donor. So you really have to take advantage of the few, that 4%, that become available for organ donation. And that starts with getting uh, consent from the donor family, and um, and then everything has to work. This this some of this process that we've already started to talk about all has to come together. The heart has to continue to beat in the donor, even though they're brain dead, um, for us to ultimately use the organ. And that's you know one of the reasons I think main reason why uh, organs are are so scarce mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, plenty of people die, but not very many people die with an organ that can be used for transplant. Very interesting. Now, an organ in an older man, so to speak, yeah. it can go into an older woman? Yeah. So there's no, you know, uh, it, it's, as you might imagine, the organs are the same um, between gender, but um, it's mainly size, blood type, um, you know. Not even age as much. Um, you know, I've seen uh, older, you know, older people with very healthy organs, and uh, so those organs can be used. So age is not, you know, there are limits, um, and uh, but we, you know, we're very careful with, you know, uh, assessing the the viability of the organ, um, and so it's mainly size, and so, you know. Uh, 
adults cannot necess- their their livers cannot uh, be put into children, for example, mm-hmm. because the the liver would be or the heart may be too big. Um, although there have been advances, uh, even when I was doing this, there were advances where they would, with livers at least, they were able to take a segment of the liver, an adult liver, and put it in the child. And um, uh, that that technology has progressed dramatically. Unbelievable. I recall on the flight end of things being in a jet. Yeah. And then we get this signal that the helicopter is inbound. Mm-hmm. And then at that point in time, we get our departure clearance, which was whatever we pretty much needed at the time. And we'd start the engines and they would be ready and on board would come um, a real competent guy like Brad here, as well as the tech people, as well as the organ. Back in the day I was doing it, the um, hard organ, which I recall yeah. most, clearly yeah. was only a, it was like in an ice chest a thermos ice chest back in the day but i remember that that here come the helicopter and then as soon as the team was on board the door was closed and we'd say lifeguard learjet 451 mm-hmm. and they would say you're cleared uh forget the taxi clearance you're cleared for takeoff <laughs> right and everybody included you know united 747s and delta 767s would be holding for you because of the priority and the the fact that minutes matter when you're carrying um, a donor a heart or essential organs such as that it was was gave you a feeling of of incredible of accomplishment yeah. like you were doing something for others and humanity and and so forth yeah i mean you were as as much a part of the transplant team as everyone else um because without capable pilots um, who knew what they were doing in these situations, um, you know, if that piece falls apart, there's no transplant. And uh, so, you know, those who receive a transplant probably appreciate this, but there are, uh, there's a whole multitude of people behind the, who are operating behind the scenes to make these transplants happen. And pilots are uniquely, uh, um, Responsible for um, the success of these transplants. Kind of interesting um, weather minimums. You know, you're yeah. right at a, you know, down to, you know, like 300 <laughs> feet right. of forward visibility on the runway. And it could be, for airline operations, uh, it could be considered a time to divert, but yet you knew how important that heart had right. to be. And so the, at that time, you, you would... Um, you would take it right down to the minimums yeah. in order to ensure the delivery of that that organ. It was uh, an incredible time. Yeah, there were times when we would. Uh, I remember very distinctly, you know, coming into a uh, you know a small airport somewhere, and uh, you know the pilots would say, "Okay, uh, we're going to be landing here," and. You know, we're still in the clouds, and all of a sudden we feel the runway underneath us because <laughs> we're, you know, the ceiling was uh, right on top of the runway. So yeah, and folks, once again, um, these hearts and organs are not well. Let's say hearts anyway; they're not uh, harvested, so to speak, from um, people prematurely. They, they, the brain has already uh, went on, and uh, the heart is still beating, allowing for the implant of that organ into another worthy individual yeah and it is it's like an unbelievable feeling how did you deal with that emotional side of things uh, brad yeah i mean when i first started uh as a transplant coordinator it was pretty surreal i mean you have to remember that um patients who are organ donors um have like uh, you said, Michael, you know, their hearts are still beating. And so they still look alive. Um, you know, their color is there. They're warm to the touch. Um, you know, they're on a mechanical ventilator, so they look like they're breathing. So they don't look like a body or a corpse going into the operating room. They look like a patient who's asleep and, you know, going to undergo surgery. So, you know, and especially uh, with kids, um, you know, some of my first organ donations were... Uh, with children, and uh, um, it's really hard, especially there were times when we would arrive a little early or, you know, at least they hadn't gotten the patient to the operating room and we'd see the family giving, 
you know, grieving over their lost child in, in certain, you know, circumstances. And, you know, it was um, difficult to see that and who, who we were going to help save. And I had to put the emotion, emotion side of uh, you know, away and not let that get into the way. I had a lot of things on my mind because I had to, you know, continue to coordinate this transplant. So there was plenty to distract me. But, uh, you know, I do, there was one uh, particular story that I shared with you. I tell the story just because it was kind of a, an interesting juxtaposition between life and death. And in the operating room in a local hospital late at night, um, all the ORs are uh, dark and quiet for the most part, and except for you know the flurry of activity that's going on in our operating room, where the um, I don't remember how many transplant teams were there, but you know these ORs can get pretty crowded um, with the different personnel working on things. So we had completed all of the preparation that the surgeons need to do and and the transplant coordinators need to do to get to be able to receive the organ once it comes off the field, and. It was, so we get everything ready, and then everything stops. Um, This is just the natural process. We stop, we all look at the clock, um, because we need to note the time, because once we uh, start removing the organ, that's, you know, that, that determines how much time you have to transplant the organ. So the flurry of activity came to a stop, got really quiet, and just as the surgeon began the procedure to remove the, the organ from the lung, this happened to donor. be a young child donor. Mm-hmm. Um, we heard the cries of a baby being born in one of the operating rooms next to us. Everybody kind of looked at each other and uh, we all thought, wow, that's uh, pretty amazing. You know, it's kind of the, the circle of life, this thin barrier between life and death where, you know, obviously the, the, the child had already died, you know, as brain death, but um, here you've got a, a, a child dying or their organs being recovered and you've got another patient being born and with the idea that the organs uh, from the donor will now be able to save uh, m- more than, you know, in some cases more than one child's life. So, you know, it, it, it just illustrates the, uh, the transplant world where patients are waiting for organs and are about to die and the question is whether they can get an organ in time and and then to experience a birth during that process uh, or you know hearing the the child coming into the world it was yeah amazing story yeah incidentally 27,169 transplants were completed in the United States in 2023 15,927 kidneys 6,143 livers, 67 pancreas, 490 combination of kidney and pancreas, 2,671 heart and lung, 1,778 and 93 other. Amazing. The United States leads the world in these type of transplants Mm -hmm. and like I said for me it was all about the heart transplant and the excitement that would surround it because you're doing something of a worthy nature and Mm -hmm. something and knowing that something's good is coming out of this operation it's it's just and and something good out of a needless tragedy in many cases I mean these uh, the donors die uh, you know tragically in many cases so it's it's really great that something good can come out of these. And, and I think it's some solace to the donor family to know that while they've lost a loved one and it's very hard knowing that um, that death could result in someone else being helped. Um, you know, and I think it says a lot that the United States leads the world in this, in this area because, you know, in many countries it's presumed consent. In other words, um, when someone dies, they're just presumed to be an organ donor. They're not voluntarily, you know, they don't make that decision. But many selfless donor families can rise above the grief and the uh, the trauma at the time that they're experiencing and be generous enough and rational enough to, to think about others at a time when, you know, their, their focus is on their lost loved one. Mm-hmm. So it says a lot for the American 
culture and the generosity of the American people mm. in our world. Yeah. One last thought is that critical organs like the heart are not carried routinely on commercial flights. Why would that be? With this ty- type of time frame, uh, there's uh, no, we, we can't take those chances. Back in the early 1990s, Nancy and I had a young, very remarkable babysitter who watched over our young two children. It was necessary that an oxygen bottle accompanying her everywhere she went. She was on the heart and lung wait list at Stanford Transplant Center. One day, Nancy and I went for a two-day getaway out on the coast, but then we received this call. They had paged her. Stanford had her a donor. What a wonderful moment that was, and what a remarkable life-giving blessing for her. New beginnings, the minutes matter, for certain. I I just uh, go back over and I think about the history of the human heart transplants, and they began with Christian Barnard, Dr. Christian Barnard, in December of 1967. Um, At the time, his, his team... And I transplanted the first human heart into a human being, and it 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 lasted for a while. It was successful, but then shortly thereafter, uh, Dr. Norman Shumway with the Stanford team performed the first heart organ transplants in the United States, and that was in January of 1968. <laughs> and in the early stages of my aviation career, I had the honor of flying some of those lifeguard flights along with the organs accompanying by a tech team such as someone like Brant. As a human being, just being involved in that was, was such a wonderful, worthy feeling that you were doing something for others. Well, well thank you so much for your time of involvement that you did. It's um, just an incredible, incredible uh, story that you had there about uh, one of yeah. the organs that you did. My pleasure. So this morning, it's brought back emotions I experienced many, many years ago as a lifeguard pilot involved in the transport of life-saving organs. Today, we've been graciously honored to have Mr. Brad Davis, former transplant coordinator, on the show to share a side of these critical life-saving operations. Thank you, Mr. Davis, for sharing with us your experience. Yeah, thank you for your service and the whole process. It's time for a short break. You've been listening to Real Estate and More Show. Interesting people like Brad Davis, topics like transplant operations and lifeguard flights, and of course, we talk about Bay Area real estate. Listen to archived Real Estate and More shows at michaelhatfieldhomes.com slash radio. That's michaelhatfieldhomes.com slash radio. The Real Estate and More Show is podcast on demand on Spotify, Amazon, Apple, iHeart, Pandora, and most major podcast platforms as well. I'm your host, Michael Hatfield. We'll be right back with our next special guest. Stay tuned.